I just want to welcome everybody. My name is Rick Brimacolm, and on behalf of the Minneapolis Club, as well as my own business, Brimacolm & Associates, welcome to the fifth season of Club Entrepreneur. Um, we have a couple of sponsors. I want to recognize those folks, the accounting firm Olson Thielen and their subsidiary, Minnesota Business Valuation Group. I have a couple of uh, Olson Thielen folks around, so stick your hand up if you would. Thank you. And then the IP law firm Schwegman Lumberg Woosner. We have a couple of folks from SLW here. Raise your hand. Got a couple over there. Thank you. And then um, the uh, law firm Linquist and Venom. And I know we have a couple of folks from Linquist as well. So thank you to those folks. Anyway, without uh, those three sponsors, this would be uh, very hard for me to do. Uh, so thank you uh, to our sponsors. Uh, as far as uh, being connected with the group, wanted to let everybody know, because we've got a number of new newcomers here, that the LinkedIn group Club Entrepreneur-Minneapolis, spelled all the way out. So Minneapolis, the law form, is a LinkedIn group, and that's a way to be connected with everyone. There's about 570 people on the list, and uh, it's just a way to, to reach out to folks that you might meet here today or maybe miss because of the size of the group. Uh, on the RSVP front, uh, to the extent that you can RSVP, uh, that helps the club with their planning, so please do that. The other uh, ancillary benefit to the RSVPs is that I get the list from them, and I try to do some matchmaking, and so to the extent that you're on the list uh, uh, at least a day in advance, uh, I go through that list the day before and try to figure out who's coming and who might be able to connect with one another. So uh, if you can RSVP, that's helpful to the club and to me. Uh, generally speaking, it is the first Thursday of the month, uh, it will be in January, the second Thursday, as it was last month because of a holiday, but generally speaking, it's the first Thursday of the month, so you can put it on a calendar for um, a reoccurring event. And people ask often, you know, why I did this uh, back at Sherpa Partners. We used to do CEO roundtables for the folks that uh, we had invested in. And so when I looked at the programming at the Minneapolis Club, I noticed that there was mostly large company things, had a 3M, local Fed, uh, Fed Reserve chair, et cetera. And those are all good things, but not necessarily something that, that you might be able to take back to your office and do something different in the afternoon. So that's kind of my goal of the content here is to uh, have you have something that you can take with you and, and um, uh, take action on uh, when you get back to your office. I also wanted to provide support for entrepreneurs and to help you folks develop uh, productive business relationships. And I know there is a lot of that going on here because I get calls and emails saying, oh, I met so-and-so at your lunch and now we're doing business. Or there's actually people who are working together. Uh, I got a founder or CEO uh, team that, that comes to these lunches that met here. So uh, reach out to the folks that, that you're meeting and have an open mind as to where that might go with your business. Uh, lastly, uh, in November, John Foley is our speaker, going to be talking about delivering uh, profitable growth uh, consistently. But John's a brand and marketing person and author, um, so he comes at it from a branding perspective. And then also, uh, Mike DeMond, where are you, Mike? Mike is in the back. Mike is our speaker in December, and he's going to be talking about uh, ways for new product development to come up with ideas for products that you don't know you need yet. So Mike will be talking to us about that in December. And then just fast forwarding to February, because I know uh, some folks have been asking about that, I'm going to do another Pecha Kucha event in February. And so just looking ahead, we have that. Uh, John Baker, our speaker today, is someone that I've heard a couple of times already. John does a fabulous job, um, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to enjoy him. And what's, what's interesting about that is that the asking formula that he's going to talk to you about is something that works not only um, in your work environment, but it might help at a board level or when you go home and you try to get your spouse or significant other to do something. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to John Baker. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. My name is John Baker. Um, and I'm pleased to be here. I'm the creator of a program called The Asking Formula. And in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to teach you how to be more effective in asking directly for what you want with more confidence, with more influence, and more self-assurance that you are going to get what you want regardless of your audience, the situation, the topic in your personal life or your professional life in the next 40 minutes. How does that sound? 
And that's pretty good stuff. Come on, how's that sound? Yeah. Thank you very much. My background, I'm the ex-COO of American Express. And a senior vice president, and I ran large global sales and service organization for them. I'm the author of, my first book was called Ready Thinking. It won the Axiom Award in 2009, beating out 60,000 other titles submitted by over 600 leading publishers. Normally I pause there for, for like applause. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, and actually that year, Peter Drucker came in second, so I, uh, I beat Peter. Of course, he was dead at that time, but nonetheless, I kicked his butt. <laughs> uh, my second book is called The Asking Formula. And it's available today. It actually got released yesterday by the publisher, so I'm really thrilled to see that in, pub in, in print, and it's available for you later on. Now, how did the, the genesis of this program, I like to tell you, was all because I ran large global organization dealing with Fortune 50 companies, helping them sell more and develop more business, but really, the genesis of what I do began at a conversation I had with my son Jack about his ninth grade homework in geometry. Now, I don't know if you think back, ninth grade was not a big year for me. I was about this height, I weighed about 100 pounds less. That whole Marianne issue cropped up in ninth grade, don't want to talk about that. And a real low point in ninth grade for me was ninth grade geometry. Because you think about it, you think it's all, how do you angle the shot into the side pocket, or how do you line up the golf ball to get it through the clown's mouth? Oh no, oh no. If you recall, this is geometry of proof statements and hypotheses and ifs, thans, and all that stuff that you don't really need in life, right? But can you tell your ninth grader that? No, you cannot. And in full disclosure, already had my scotch that evening. So he's talking to me about ninth grade geometry. I'm looking at him about it. And I finally, in an exasperation, said, Jack, did the teacher talk about this today in class? Oh, yeah, Dad. But she went so fast, nobody understood it. I mean, all the guys around me were completely lost. And then I said, well, did you raise your hand and ask for help? Well, she doesn't really like that. She likes to keep her questions to the end. She's got a lot to cover, and she figures that some of the stuff she may cover will answer the question we had. But then the end of class came, and the bell rang, Dad, and we had to go out. But she did say, she did say that if we had an issue or any questions, we could come in after school and address her uh, in her office after school hours. And I said, well, did you go in and ask for help after school? And he said, what did he say? Of course not, because why? What, what happened when he heard the words after school? All listening stops, right? Well, that's after school. I was more concerned with his inability or unwillingness to ask confidently for what he wanted than I was that he would ever need ninth grade geometry. And then I'd go to work, and like I mentioned, I ran a large organization. We had a, a big sales nut to hit every year. We had a billion dollars of new sales, a half a billion dollars of cross sales. I had a large service organization, great veteran salespeople who had a problem asking for the close or asking for a referral. We'd have to raise our fees and I had all these relationship managers who were scared to death about going out and asking for a fee increase. I'd sit through endless PowerPoints trying to figure out what does these people want from me? Why don't they just ask for it? My voicemail would be filled up. It seemed like we had a chronic situation where people had a challenge in asking effectively for what they wanted. And I gotta tell you, that brought me to my first axiom. Maybe you agree with this. Here's a truth in my life. You don't get what you don't ask for. Would you agree with that? Can I have agreement? Can you guys raise your hand if you agree with that? Yeah, because if you, if you don't agree with that, then it's going to be a long 40 minutes here. But, so if you agree with that, we're all good. But I tell you, I had great leaders in my career, wonderful leaders, not once did they ever walk into my office and say, eh, ah, thought about it today, I think you need a raise. Never once. Or a bigger office. You know, just noodled on it. You need a promotion. We at American Express, I have no hooks in them anymore, uh, but I gotta tell you, we took everybody off, everybody, 150,000 employees, to a two-day offsite on the importance of brand. That's how much it mattered to us. We busted our humps when it came to giving good client service. It was just ingrained in our DNA. We went well overboard on every service environment because we knew it was essential to the brand image that American Express was trying to portray, but not once 
in 20 years of working with clients and satisfying them and working my hind, hind end off to make sure they are happy, not once in that 20 years did I ever have a client call and say, we just bought our second largest competitor and we want to give you that business. Not once. <laughs> not once. You had to ask for it. Now they'd say, we want you to bid for it, but not once did they ever say, here's yours. It's yours for the taking. You don't even have to ask for it. Asking is at the central part of our success. Before I go any further, I wanted to quickly go over this continuum because some people go, well, how does asking fit into communications? We influence in a number of ways. One of the ways we influence, and by the way, if you want these slides, just send me an email at john at the asking formula and I'll send you a copy. One of the ways we inform, influence every day is we inform each other of data facts and detail to help that person gain information so that they can make a decision. It's a pretty risk-free way of influencing because, quite frankly, we don't have a dog in this fight. We're going to give you information. Hopefully, you'll make a decision and a conclusion that I want you to make, but I'm not going to ask for it. I'm just going to inform you of it. We do this all the time. The second way we influence is we have, when we have the responsibility and the authority, we can command people to do things. We're obligated to that. If you ever worked for somebody who couldn't delegate, you know how difficult that is when they have the authority and the responsibility, but they don't tell you what to do. It's a very challenging thing. If you have the responsibility and the authority, tell somebody what to do. Don't ask them what to do, because quite frankly, that gets confusing. I'm one of 35 speakers on assignment with the Department of Defense. And I work with soldiers returning home from the battlefield, helping them reintegrate to the situation they find in civilian life. And it's a, does anybody serve here by chance? Anybody? Thank you for your service. I am, I've been doing this for, four, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and for those of you who have loved ones or friends who are serving, I have to tell you, I'm very impressed. I've been doing this for four years now. And they're really struggling with the long deployments and the multiple deployments, helping people reintegrate. And one of the challenges they have is after deployment, after you've been in an atmosphere of being told what you do all the time, it's hard to come home and be self-motivated. Why didn't you get off the couch and go find a job today? Nobody told me to, right? And for the last several years, I don't do anything unless I'm told to do those things. So we have to help our soldiers and their families reacclimate to an issue of, no, this is more influence now than being commanded. And vice versa. Some people would come home and they've been used to giving commands. And how does that work when you come back in your home life and all of a sudden you're telling your spouse to balance the checkbook differently? Does that work for anybody? Of course not. They have to learn different ways of influencing. Asking is a part of an influential chain of how we communicate. And it's a difficult, the most difficult part. Why? We want an outcome. We want somebody to decide the thing that we want them to decide, but yet we don't have the authority to tell them to do it. We want more than just imparting information and letting things drift. We want an outcome. And that's where asking gets tough. That's why it's such a difficult thing. Hey, simple concept. Very difficult to master. Which brings me to Bill and Cheryl. I'm going to read you this case study. And then I'm going to ask you for your input. So listen carefully as I read you about Bill and Cheryl. This is part of our workshop series, uh, and it's lab number one. And Bill is an employee at Rockford Print. Anybody here from Rockford Print? Thank God. Okay, Bill is from Rockford Print. Sometimes I'll read about Bill and I'll somebody will raise up. I don't know Bill. He's, I'm from, yeah. This is uh, fictional. Bill is an employee at Rockford Print and has been upset ever since the company announced layoffs last year. Fewer staff meant more work, and he is struggling to keep his head above water. At times, it feels like Bill is doing the work of three people. Last week, he missed two important deadlines, something that had never happened before. Worse, the client reprimanded Bill in front of his peers. Bill's being pulled in so many directions, he didn't know what work to do first and what could go to the bottom of the pile. So he decides to meet with Cheryl, that's his manager, and let her know about his concerns. One, Bill is working long hours, consistently coming in on weekends, but at the same pay he had before the layoffs. Two, he hasn't had a vacation since the layoffs were announced. Nine months ago, had to cancel two pre-planned family outings. 
Bill is frustrated that his work product isn't up to, to uh, standard. He's embarrassed by what happened with the client, and he's concerned that his year-end performance review will reflect his missed standards. Bill is doing the work of t at least two people and often doing supervisory work where he's never been trained. So Bill spoke with Cheryl about his concerns, left her office feeling better because he was sure Cheryl understood the pressure he felt and he was confident Cheryl would do what she could to make the situ situation better. All right, E-Club. I need your help. Based on what you just heard, What does Bill want? Microphone on. What does Bill want? Recognition. Recognition for what he's doing. Going through a lot, isn't he? What else? A reasonable workload. I'm sorry? Well, thank you, the, our gentleman from New York City. I love it. Um, normally, pay comes out very early on the East Coast when you do this workshop. But in the Midwest, it's lower on the list. We just don't, you know, we're not sure we want to ask for more money. Um, sometimes it doesn't come out at all, and then I go, well, how about more money? And everybody's like, yeah, that, well, we thought of that, but we didn't really want to, we didn't really want to say it out loud. What else does Bill want? Time off. Hey, how about some time off? Absolutely. Anything else? More, more staff, more help, yeah. What else did you hear in that case? Yep, more vacation. You bet. And it, yeah, remember that? He, trying to be a supervisor. He doesn't know how. He wants some training. He needs some help setting priorities. <clears throat> Can everybody see this? Do I have to increase the font? <laughs> Anything else? These are all good. None of them are right. Um, Yes, he, he, could, he doesn't know what to go first, right? What goes to the bottom of the pile, so how do I delegate? Anything else? What does Bill want? Support. Yes, support from the back of the room. Thank you. Come on, think. Yes? Respect. Wants respect. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the queen of soul. Um, validation. Not quite there. Insurance? Did you say assurance or insurance? Yeah, I think we've got some insurance folks in here. Well, that's Cheryl's job. Yeah, it's almost like he wants Cyril to have his back, right? A lot of things happen. All right. Do you know what Bill wants? We don't know. We don't know what he wants. Do you know what he wants? I wrote the case. I don't know what he wants. I had a bunch of engineers who started debating this with me. And I was like, well, you do realize that Bill is a made-up figure, right? And I made him up. <laughs> and I don't know what he wants. We don't know what Bill wants. What is the likelihood that Cheryl will give Bill what he wants? Zero? One in? 15 or 20? Because what does Bill put her in a situation to do? He has, she has to guess. And, and when you hear this from somebody, what does it sound like? It sounds like whining. That brings us, whoop, son of a gun, we lost something here. Hold on. Let me get my IT department on this. Asking for him, and will ask him number two. Not knowing what you want before asking for what you want means what? <laughs> Say it loud, means what? You don't get what you want. Would everybody agree with this? Yes. 
Not knowing what you want in a sales meeting, in a client call, in a staff meeting, in a one-on-one -on -one with a group of people, not knowing what the outcome you desire is, means your audience has to guess at it. Not knowing what you want prior to asking for what you want means you don't get what you want. You all agreed with that. Five minutes ago, you agreed with the first axiom. You don't get what you don't ask for. So we know we have to ask for what we want, and we know what we want, because we've learned this. Right? Anybody disagreeing here? What, what's the second step of the asking formula? First step is know what you want. Second step is ask for it. When? Right away. How? Directly. I don't get it if I don't ask for it, and I know what I want. It's like geometry, A plus B equals C. See, we're using that stuff, unbelievable. But why, oh why, if we know this intuitively, we get this in our DNA, why, oh why, don't we ask for what we want? Why? Fear of what? Fear of rejection. Dun, dun, dun. Why else? We don't know what we want. We didn't do the first step of the asking formula. Should read my book. Why else? Why don't you ask for what you want? Get in the back, yes. Yeah, well, you should know what I want, right? You should know. How does that work for you in your life, in your experience today? Oh, they should have known I wanted the clothes, right? I didn't ask for the business, but what do you think they think I was doing here? Why else don't you ask for what you want? You know you have to. Prior history, windmilling, right? Why would I go fight that battle again, right? Prior history, what else? I'm sorry. Yeah, I might just get what I asked for. <laughs> yeah, who somebody said Bill wanted Cheryl's job. Yeah, I can see that happening. Well, here, Bill, you take the job. And he's like, hold it. <laughs> somebody else. Yeah, is it reasonable? I'm not sure this is what I'm asking for is reasonable. I don't know how to ask. Yeah, I might be penit punished. They might take something away. Actually, in that lab we read, that happens. Cheryl makes the decision, takes something away from Bill, and he feels what? What happens? He feels punished. Well, I'm not going to go into Cheryl's office again. You know, I'm not going to fight that battle again. Look what happened. Anything else? Why don't you personally ask for what you want? I'm not worthy. I don't have confidence. Yeah, that's, hey, that's so true. Did you ever hear that? We're from Minnesota, and it's not polite to ask. Yes, in the back. So true. I, run, I ran a large sales group. They pre many would prefer not to ask for the sale because they might get a no. What's up with that? Because they are not going to get a? But they still have a prospect, don't they? Damaging to the relationship. Now, the, I've made fun of the East Coast, and I do a lot of work on the East Coast. I do work in the South and in California and the Midwest as well. There are definitely geographic differences in how we culturally ask or don't ask for what we want. When I talk to folks in the East Coast, I'll be honest with you, they worked there many years uh, with American Express. They are more aggressive and abrasive, not good askers, but they get it out there quicker. We are in the Midwest, where I was raised, are much more passive aggressive, right? Geography has a big role to play. Gender has a big role to play. Generations have a big role to play in how we ask. So generations that used to, to sending text might have a difficult time looking somebody in the eye and asking for the business. But there's a gargantuan reason that we don't ask for what we want, and it's called biology. In your skull, in the reptilian part of your brain, 
the oldest part of your brain sets a place called the hypothalamus. Your ancestors had this, the ancestors who didn't have this got eaten. Because the hypothalamus does what? It governs your response to physical risk. The hypothalamus governs fight or flight response. And when it is triggered, when, you're, when you sense that you are at physical risk, the hypothalamus kicks in, takes control, floods your system with adrenaline and cortisol, your palms sweat, your eyes dilate, your heart races, your blood pressure goes up, all in a fraction of a second. If you've ever been close to a car crash, you're in a car crash, things slow down. The next day, you're sore because you grabbed onto that wheel so, so hard. You were just superhuman. That's the hypothalamus saving the entity from a perceived physical risk. If you didn't have that in the, end, in the back part of your skull, you weren't around. You couldn't sit there and Google saber tooth, right? I mean, you had to figure out what to do and make that call. Now, my first book had a lot of hypothalamus in it because of the prefrontal cortex of your body, of your brain, is the newest part of your brain, and that allows you to do something no other species can do, which is you can predict the future. The prefrontal cortex lets you predict the future. Now, it's probably not right, but if I said, what's going to happen after you leave here? You're going to go have the most delicious hot food Sunday? You're already thinking of that. You conjured it up on nothing. It's wonderful. So you get the prefrontal part of your brain going, this is the future, back part of your brain going, it's risky. That's why people don't change. Now, I'll give you an example of how my hypothalamus kicked in. I used to be a doorman at a club. All right, it was a disco. But nonetheless, I was the doorman at the club. Not the bouncer, I was the guy taking money. And sure enough, one night, there was a fight. A couple guys got into it. And I'll give you one guess over what it was. A girl, right. And I got into it right in front of us, and in the middle of that, out of nowhere, one guy pulls a knife. Now, I did not go to knife fighting school, did not take that course, but I immediately knew what was going on. Didn't have to think about it, didn't have to categorize the knife, just immediately knew what was going on. My hypothalamus took over. Things slowed down. I remember some things very clearly. First thing I remember is I was moving away from the knife. <laughs> Not thinking about moving away, moving away from the knife. The second thing I remember is a young girl screaming at the top of her lungs. Later I found out that was me. The third thing I remember, <laughs> the third thing I remember is Bob moving towards the knife. Then I remember Bob having the guy on the ground, I remember Bob having the knife in his hand and the situation was over. Later when the adrenaline goes out of your system, the cortisol goes out of your system, you're tired and you're just exhausted, it's like you've been lifting rocks all day. And I, I was talking to Bob and I said, uh, that was really scary. And he goes, yeah, it really was. And I said, well, you sure didn't act scared. And here's what he said, this might be something you write down. He said, I was as afraid as you were, but I could do more with my fear than you can. I was, see, fear is there. Fear is there. He just had what? What did I have compared to Bob? Training. Bob was a third degree black belt in Shodagat karate. Bob had gone through hours in the gym practicing, not how to have no fear, how to deal with situations when fear is present. I had as much fear as you did. I knew how to deal with my fear better than you could. Fast forward to conversation today. Right next to your hypothalamus sits a part of your brain called the, the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray is in the primal, most uh, reptilian part of your brain. It's been there forever. And it's there to regulate your response to social threats. Your ancestors were as concerned about being kicked off the island, being excommunicated from the tribe, being on their own, as they were from physical threats. What happens when you perceive rejection? Your body floods with cortisol and adrenaline, your palms sweat, your eyes dilate, your heart races. Sometimes you freeze, can't pick up the phone, can't ask one more time, can't do it, phone's too heavy, can't go ask that one more time, right? The hypothalamus measures your response to physical risk, your periaqueductal grave, same thing, only with social rejection risk. 
That's pretty powerful. Do you know that the part of your brain that gets stimulated when you hear the word no is exactly the same part of your brain that gets stimulated when you touch a hot tea kettle? Same part of the brain. Rejection hurts? Yes, it does. So we have all this working against us. You just gave me a whole list of reasons that you have for not asking, and you know you have to inside. And then we have biology. Where does that all lead us? That's right. You become a badass. <laughs> that's the best I got. Badass. You start behaving in a way that's inconsistent with your goals. And when you are a badass, you don't lead directly by asking for what you want. You lead with the least risky thing, which is what? Information. I don't want to risk asking and being told no or worse yet, being ridiculed, right? Why didn't Jack ask for what he wanted? Because you know what was going to happen in math class. Jack was going to be up there. Mrs. Stern, the teacher, was up there doing her things. That's her name, believe it or not, Mrs. Stern. Jack raises his hand, Mrs. Stern, I got a question. What's she going to do? She's going to turn. Weren't you paying attention? Anybody else but Jack not following? No. He knows what's going to happen. All of his buddies are going to like, we got it. No, we're fine. We're good. <laughs> you don't want that, so you lead with information because it's risk-free. I got no dog in the fight. Look at the marketing materials. Let me give you all the, let me give 50 PowerPoint slides. Let me give you all the background I possibly have. You'll make the right decision. I don't have to ask for it. By the way, I'm going to go through this if you want to follow along. There's three outcomes to that. Two of them are not good. The first outcome is your audience stops listening. I stopped listening to you. Not sure where you're going with this. Not sure what it has to do with me. I've checked out. I'm, I start multitasking. Or maybe I'm kind enough to sit there and look at you and nod my head once in a while. But I used to tell my staff, you're talking to the back of my head. Imagine me walking out that door. I've got a board meeting come up, I've got a server down in India, I've got to do so many different things with my budget, it's unbelievable, and you are not getting to the point I am like I'm walking out the door. I've stopped listening to you. That's bad, isn't it? What's worse, by starting with information, you are encouraging calls for more information. Here's some information for you. Great, I got some questions. Great, here's some more information. I got more questions about that. Here's some information that you should have on your questions that you just asked. And you start this process we call looping. You're looping in here, going through iterations of information before you ever ask a question or ask for what you want. I've had salespeople who come to me and they go, we are ready to sign on the documents. I go, that's good. Go out there, get the clothes. They come back and I say, how'd the meeting go? Pretty good, they had a lot of questions. We couldn't answer them all, so we're gonna go back out there next month and you know, see if we can fill in the gaps for them. Information looping is one of the ways you sabotage your professional image and your effectiveness. Why didn't Bill get what he wanted? Because he was vague about it. Why don't you get what you want? Because I have nowhere to put it. I have no focus. You were being vague, and folks, what happens in vagueness Stays in vagueness. Thank you very much. I play the room six days a week. <laughs> All right, but let's say I actually followed that. I'm with you. So now you're going to bring me facts. You know that childhood obesity is reaching chronic levels, right? You know that's true. And the fact of the matter is it's because kids are drinking more soda pop than ever before. Interesting thing about facts, you have your own. You're sitting there going, you know what, that may be true, but I think the problem with kids these days is they never exercise. They don't get off the sofa, they're playing too many video games. Somebody over here is like, yeah, we just, we just killed the referendum to increase FIAD as a program within the schools. See, we all have different facts. If you are lucky enough to get the one fact your audience agrees on, good for you. If not, guess what, three outcomes. First one, I stop listening. I just disagree with your facts, right? You're not, you've lost all credibility because you brought the wrong take on this. The second thing that happens is I start debating you. Because be, by leading with information and facts allows me to debate with you. Don't you guys have in-laws? Haven't you never seen this before? This is unbelievable. You bring something up, it's debate. And you're back looping. 
Third thing that might happen is I get a chance to give you my reasons. The reason I bring all this up is because I have a special vitamin water we want to sell to your school district and get out of the whole soda pop thing. Now by then I've gotten back into this, I've already stopped this thing, I'm going to loop through the reasons. And way down here, can you guys see it up on the board on the very, very bottom left? What's that word? Stay down there, after you go through all of this, you finally get to your ask. Next formula, bad askers bury the ask. You can hear it in your staff meetings, you can hear it in your sales meeting, you can hear it in yourself coming out. I've buried the ask. My audience doesn't know what I want because I led with information. Know what you want. Second step, ask for it. And how do you ask for it? Here's it. I am asking for. Right? I don't know how to ask for it. Pretty easy. I am asking for you to consider me the primary vendor for this service. And then show what you want. Two-thirds of your audience wants to and desires to learn visually. So when you ask for what you want, hold it up and point to it. So they can visually get the information so you're not providing them that constant dialogue that just gets in the way of your ask. I learned this from my dad, who was a consummate sales guy. Raging alcoholic as well, but nonetheless, consummate sales guy. I think he earned five fortunes in his life. Lost six fortunes in his life. So we got that going for us. But he taught me this when we were selling candy at, at uh, Babe Ruth, for Babe Ruth Baseball, my brother Tom and I, right? A lot of guys had to sell candy for, for Little League Baseball, but what they do is they sell door to door. Oh no, for Big Don, we sold tavern to tavern, right? So what he would do is we'd put Tom and I in the car, and we'd drive to a, to a VFW or a Legion or something, and, and he'd leave us in the car, and he'd go into the bar, for, he said, give me 10 minutes, give me 10 or 15 minutes. So we'd sit out there, which when you're 13 year old, it's like, that's like hours, right? I mean, 10 minutes is clicking by so slow. But then we'd go into the tavern, and he'd be already at the bar having a drink or two, and we'd, op, we'd, we'd walk up to him, see, like we didn't know him, and we'd say, hello, sir, how are you tonight? Would you like to buy a box of delicious candy to help support the Babe Ruth League? And he'd, he'd like act like he just won the lottery. Oh my God, Little League baseball players, let's go, everybody, let's buy this, these kids candy. We sold candy like you can believe, right? <laughs> And we, went, we did this from tavern to tavern to tavern. Once in a while, we'd go into a place and a bartender would go, you can't have these kids in here. Get out of here, kids. And my dad would stand up. Of course, by now, we didn't know it then, but now we know he was absolutely hammered, right? He'd stand up, and he'd look at the bartender, and he'd go, is this the American Legion? Or is this the Communist Legion? Where am I drinking? <laughs> but what he'd do is he'd have us show the candy. Open up a box, John. Show them the candy. Show what they're buying. Not the box of candy. Show them the chocolates and the caramels and how they're all lined up. And then just quickly to close that story, just to show you how my dad was, he'd come home, drop us off. Actually, people used to say, well, weren't you scared being in the parking lot? Wasn't that child abuse? We drove him home, OK? So I mean, we had, <laughs> it was a different era. We drove home, and we'd, you know, he'd drop us off. And then he'd tell my mom, been with these kids all day. I'm heading down to Slippery's for a couple of beers. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> show what you want. Big step here. We are now, in the formula, we're now stopping with me. It's what I want. It's how I'm going to ask for it. It's how I show it. From now on, in the next three steps of the formula, we probe about best reasons. We probe about you, the audience. What's in it for you to give me what I want? We have a whole curriculum about how to get this. And at the end of the day, it starts with the word who. Who are you selling to? It's up to them to tell you what's in it for them to give you what you're asking for. And you need three of those reasons. Now, a lot of concert around the word why, but why comes from who? What's in it for you? What's important to you? What are your triggering events? As a matter of fact, when you get into it, here's our schematic. Most people start with what? The concept of what I'm selling and what I can do. And it's all I. You're still in the me zone. Don't do that. Tell me about you. What's in it for you to buy from me? What are you looking for? What's the emotional hook? Where do you want to get a leg up? Why is this important? It all gets down to their why, the connection that you need to have for best reasons. I'm covering this at a very high level, but if you take anything away from me and you go out to a sales call or an influential meeting this afternoon, start with asking a personal connection question. Because people will tell you what's in it for them. 
I had a big client, Gap Stores. We won Gap from, uh, in a competitive bid, and we'd go out there and we'd present to them, and they'd roll their eyes and gnash their teeth and make snide comments. And this was not cheap. We'd fly six people out from New York to San Francisco to do this. And I always wondered, why are they so cynical? We're doing everything we told them we'd do. So finally, I corralled the, the key decision maker. Her name was Sue, and I said, Sue, what's going on? Help me understand why we're getting this kind of treatment when we come out here. And Sue said, I apologize for it, but I tell you what, ever, when, when it came down to choosing a vendor, it was between you and your key competitor. Four of the committee voted for them, four of the committee voted for you. I was the decision maker. I decided American Express. Now every time American Express is in the news, for whatever reason, a server went out, privacy issue, something happened in Indonesia, something happened in Mexico, it doesn't matter. These guys come down and they put that in front of me and they make me feel like a chump for picking American Express. Now I know, John, you guys have millions of clients all over the globe and thousands of employees. I get it. But man, that just makes me feel bad. I would have never gotten that from what? I would have never gotten that from giving her more data. She told me a best reason. I don't want to feel embarrassed in front of my contemporaries. She was from the HR side. They were from finance. So what we did every morning, we wake up and we just shoot her a note. Here's all the things that are happening in the world with American Express. Here's our response to them. So next time they came down, she'd hold up that piece of paper and said, yeah, i am already got that. That's covered. That's old news. What else you got for me? Right? Never. But we started with who? And by the way, you need three of those. Why? Because since th there's three reasons why, which is helpful, right? I mean, if there was 12 reasons why you need three reasons, that would be disjointed. But nonetheless, there's three reasons why you need three reasons. Three best reasons in the model because, number one, since the earliest days of your learning cognitively, you've learned in threes. A, B, C, Do, Re, Mi, one, two, three. Cinderella and the three bears, thank you. Isn't it three bears? Uh, Goldilocks and the three bears, sorry, I threw a curve at you. Um, Rub-a-dub-dub. Real estate is? What's Nike's logo? Just do it, not do it, just do it. I mean, these are smart people who are putting the power of three into their sales pitches because you are used to it. Your audience is used to three. Number two, we look for patterns as human beings. Two is not enough. Four is what? Looping. Three is the minimum amount you need to establish a pattern so that your logic flows. And three, what you're doing right now, the third reason people want three reasons is because they'll wait for that third reason to come out. I've got dozens of reasons why you should buy my book. Eh, don't have that much time. I got three reasons why this will make a big impact in your life. First reason. Second reason. And finally, the third reason. You're walking them through progression. They're used to seeing and feeling. And all those reasons are what they have said, or they have indicated, or they have shared with you what's in it for them to give you what you want. Oftentimes, we just go to the, the wall of the conference room. And we say, right there it says, in your mission and value statement, that you want your employees to be the number one asset of this firm. Best reason. What do you do after that? Stop talking. <laughs> Zip it. It is time for you to stop hyper confabulating. Give your audience a chance to answer. A best practice, simply respond with your ask again. That's why I am asking for. We sell through the close, and there's a huge, huge temptation to do what right now? We've just done our formula, we worked hard, we get to the point, and instead of stop talking, what do we do? We get back into the looping. I don't think I gave you all the information necessary because you didn't come right out and fill the vacuum so here's all my sales literature again. And we've destroyed all the credibility and confidence and influence that we've just built up. Just repeat your ask. That's why I'm asking. I'm asking for a 5% raise. There's a lot of reasons for this, but three jump right up top of mind. Reason one, reason two, reason three. That's why I'm asking for a 5% raise. Where's all your data? It's in the appendix. It's in an attachment. It's in your back pocket. You don't lead with it. 
If you lead with it, you'll never get out of there. When I sell to groups especially, some guy, normally in the group you have this big oak table and there's six guys there at the big oak table, and then sitting behind them are all the people that want to be at the big oak table, right? I mean, so what they're going to do is they're going to ask some arbitrary, nonsensical question, and if you're not smart about the asking formula, you're going to go down there. You're going to answer his question for 40 minutes. Make sure that he is completely satisfied with the esoteric nature of his question. You looped, you buried the ask, and you're stuck down here. You don't. Yeah, yeah we're ISO 9000 compliant. That's in Appendix A, page 52. That's why quality is so important to us as it is to you. Back to the best reason. All right. Everybody just breathe in, breathe out. Just take a look at what's up on the screen. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? Look it, it's amazing. Right there, in the meeting you have this afternoon, what I want you to do is write down what you want. Write it in specificity. Because nobody else will see this, this is yours. I want a $200,000 order from Acme Company this afternoon. Second step. You script out, I am asking you for what? $200,000 Acme contract. Hold it up. Hold up what you're going to do. Hold up what is in it for them. A lot of reasons for this. Reason number one, reason number two, reason number three. That's why I'm asking for your commitment on the $200,000 project. Zip it. You've got it. There's nothing more you need to learn. You can put this into play. Right now. What else do you need? No! Make sure you follow the six steps. And what you're going to find is tremendous amount of influence. How confident are you when you have this in your back pocket? This is what I'm going to ask. These are the reasons. You stand with great body, our, our body language, great posture. Would you always get yes? Of course not. That's big, being big boys and girls. Sometimes you get a no. But it's not the no that's in the bottom left quartile. It's not the no you get when you're not prepared for your interaction. You'll be out of that quadrant. Every interaction you have will be something you're prepared to be influential in. I want to thank you for your time. A couple ways, a couple things that I want, so I model behavior. One, I want to stay connected with you. So if you want these slides, send me an email, john at theaskingformula.com, and I'll get them out to you. My website comes up, and there will be a chance for you to uh, register on my lab notes. These are tools, tips, scenarios, and people like you who respond and give us uh, examples of how they use the formula to accomplish what they wanted. So you learn from somebody else. And then finally, I have to pitch the book. You guys get it today, and no one else in the country has that opportunity. I will sign it if you want, and then last but not least, and it's cheap, by the way, very inexpensive. Um, last but not least, let me thank you for your time and attention. Go use the formula. Thanks for having me, Rick.